supposed to be a brotherhood. So that's what it started out to be. The Aryan Brotherhood of Texas was formed in the Texas prison system in the early 1980s. We were seeing our own kind punked out and treated like bitches. White folks didn't stick together. We stuck with our own inside. And of course, anything you have inside, any gang, you're gonna get out. You know, when you get out, a couple of you get together and you start doing this and that, and it, and it grew. It was all about business. Drugs, prostitution, sold a lot of drugs. A lot of females, we were up and down 35. If you ran up 35, pulled in one of the motels, you bought anything ex ex extracurricular, money went in my pocket. Uh, it wasn't uncommon to have really about, about $70,000 a week in cash. They had a constitution which essentially laid out everything that this particular group does in terms of the rank structure, in terms of uh, what their beliefs are, in terms of uh, everything from what happens when someone is disciplined to, to what doesn't happen when someone is disciplined. They have different levels of discipline. Back in the day, we would get tattoos of, the, of our shield. If you didn't held up, you didn't held up when you got X back then, I'd come peel your patch off of you. So if, if you've got it tattooed on it, you can imagine I'm going to skin a chunk of your side. Robberies, hounds, uh, methamphetamine going up and down I-20, credit card fraud, it's all murders, obviously. It's kidnapping. They talk about kidnapping between each other like it's nothing. Like having somebody in the closet is nothing to them. Murder, if it's ordered, it's nothing to these guys. They're so loyal. And that's, I think that's the scariest part, is how loyal they are. And you don't cross them. Get in, Georgia. Violence to each other, mostly a lot to each other. They were kept picking each other off one by one. Clearly, they're a very violent group, and in order to instill, instill discipline within the organization, they need to ensure that they can go out and commit violence against each other. Look at me. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, Let me tell you something. Oh, yes, sir. You hear me? Yes, sir. If you ever say Aryan Brotherhood of Texas or Colorado, yes, we'll sir. kill you. So they use that to kind of set an example. For, uh, for others that are thinking about perhaps swaying or straying from their blind faith commitment to the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas. A blind faith commitment is a document that a prospect signs stating in fact that he is going to be a member of the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas and it's a commitment that you take for life. There was a homicide in the Dallas-Fort Worth area of Brianna Taylor in 2006. She was tortured and ultimately she was dismembered and put in a uh, plastic bathtub uh, filled with quick creek and dumped in Lake Ray Hubbard. There was no way. Things got so carried away, there was no way she could. Once, he, once, once things got out of hand, that was the only way it could end. When we all were briefed on this particular homicide from the folks from Dallas, we all knew that something had to be done about the ABT after hearing what happened to Brianna Teller. <laughs> In the summer of 2008, I was targeting an armed career criminal who we believed was providing silencers and firearms to the Bandito Outlaw and Motorcycle Gang. In the course of executing a search warrant at this individual's residence, we obtained a number of different firearms, and in doing so, he was looking at a mandatory prison sentence of 15 years or more. It wasn't long before he decided he wanted to cooperate with us, and in doing so, uh, he said that not only did he know some leaders within the Bandito Outlaw Motorcycle Gang, but he also knew the general of the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas. One of the things that the ABT would typically do every month is they would hold what they call church meetings. And in these church meetings, what would occur is they would discuss their criminal activity, they would, just, they would collect dues for the organization, and uh, they would discuss bank, gang business. A big part of this case was built on uh, the development and cultivation of confidential informants. Someone would become a CI for multiple reasons. Maybe they're pending charges, for one. And the other reason is some do it for financial reasons. So a confidential informant, if he's actually in these church meetings, could do a number of different things. One, he could record uh, what was happening. And secondly, he can come back. If he wasn't recording, he could tell us exactly what was being said by the leaders within the organization. Kicked in my hotel room door. They charged me with identity theft, prostitution. I mean, the list could have went on and on and on. And he wouldn't f about telling me that's exactly what they were going to do. He says, well, okay, you need, I need you to talk to these people. And it was the FBI. And I was like, oh, f and that's when it got real. So you always want to make sure that your CI's identity is, is never disclosed or that the ABT in this particular case uh, doesn't know who your CIs are. If I was a snitch, that he would torture me himself. 
He would kill me himself and that he would spend hours torturing me first. The ABT confidential informants, for example, a lot of them were hooked on methamphetamine. And you can't really be a confidential informant if you're using narcotics. If I, if I wasn't using and, and showing that I was doing drugs, they wouldn't have trusted me. They're making their approach. We went after all the generals. There were five generals within the ABT. Just went through the back pants. We also indicted a number of majors and captains and essentially all leaders within this organization. It was the first time in law enforcement history that uh, the RICO had been used to take down the entire leadership of a prison gang that had a nationwide presence. We had 73 indictments. Of those 73 indictments, 100% were convicted. I believe that their command and control capabilities have been severely diminished. They'll continue to do what they do, and obviously we'll continue to do what we do. It's non-existent on the streets. I mean, you have a few that have tried to step up and step in to put, but there's nothing. I mean, it's, the head's cut off. She did a green light on me, and she just find me and kill me. Pretty much at all costs. No matter where, I will be in fear my whole life. He told me they'd be coming for me, and I told him straight up that when they do, just like the last time they did, that when you send somebody slick, you better f send somebody this time.